Would you like me to seduce you? That's it, man. It's game over, man. It's game over. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, he walks in a mind. Fight for him, always. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. It's a trap! Everything has an elm strings. Hey guys, welcome to the Celluloid Fiends podcast. I'm your host, Mo Long. You can follow me on Twitter at Mitchell C. Long, and you can read my writing on film and much more at cupofmo.com. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate it. And you know what else we'd really appreciate? Head over to the iTunes store or the Google Play store, your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and subscribe and leave us a rating. And as always, I'm joined by my wonderful co-hosts. What's up, everybody? I'm Gabriel also, if you want to go to our Facebook page and give us a like, that'd be greatly appreciated. Now, you may have not heard about from us the last few weeks, but there's been a couple things that are going on. Um, I got engaged. Um, I got a new job, and uh, Mo got sick. So at this point, I'd like us to take a moment to talk about the real pressing issue. It's a good idea. Mo, how did you get sick, and what kind of sickness? Did uh, well, Gabe, you know this is a family show. I'm, I'm not really sure that we can delve into that, so we'll just we'll skip over that for now. All right, all right, all right. B- big congrats to Gabe on his engagement. Uh, super happy for him, and it's uh, it's nice to be recording again. Yes. Uh, so tonight we are going to be talking about the 1987 sci-fi cult classic, The Hidden. So The Hidden was released in 87, and it sits at a respectable 79% critic rating on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, with a 72 audience score. It grossed over $9 million at the box office, and it's directed by Jack Shoulder, who really made a name for himself in the horror genre, directing films like A Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two, Freddy's Revenge, Alone in the Dark, and Wishmaster 2, Evil Never Dies. And of all of his films, Shoulder actually says this is his favorite favorite uh so this was uh, this was my pick yeah this was a mole pick, this was definitely a mole pick. <laughs> but uh but gabe i, I think gabe liked this one uh, which yeah, was... I enjoyed it thoroughly. this was something i've never heard of um mo came over to my place and said you gotta watch this and i'm like okay i gave it a shot and it was honestly a really good movie i recommend and I, I brought the VHS over, but unfortunately, Gabe still needs to up his VCR game. Yeah. So we ended up uh, just streaming it. Yeah, no VCR over at my apartment, only Blu-ray and streaming. <laughs> uh, yeah, next time I'll just have to bring my VCR. So going into this, did you expect to enjoy it? No. Well, um, you know my personal taste in movies. So I didn't think you were necessarily going to bring but I actually really enjoyed this movie a little more than I thought I would have. I, I think I had the reaction that you had the slap shot, which was <laughs> I thought it was going to be a good movie, but it was definitely better than I thought it was going to be. So let's let's talk a little bit about what this movie uh, focuses on. So it stars Michael Nori and Kyle MacLachlan. Uh, where Nori plays Los Angeles detective Thomas Beck, and McLaughlin stars as FBI Special Agent Lloyd Gallagher, and they're investigating a string of murders and crimes committed by citizens with no previous criminal record. So uh, there, are, there are a few things that I really like about this movie and that inspired me to pick it. For one, the film just feels, for the most part, very unique. It kind of, at the end, I feel like falls into a bit more of a cliche sci-fi film, but mostly it's very novel, especially the opening shot where it introduces a character who's there just for a brief period, and he robs a bank, kills the security guards, and goes on this crazy car chase through L.A. Uh, And it also reminds me of a number of classic sci-fi films from, uh, from... John Carpenter's The Thing, 
to Invasion of the Body Snatchers and even some of those buddy cop films like 48 Hours and The Beverly Hills Cop. So it has this kind of weird sci-fi but also like buddy cop comedy vibe to it. No one talks about cop when it comes to buddy cop. That's one I haven't even seen. Ever since directed film, it came out, I don't know, maybe five years ago. And uh, it had Kevin Hart as um, Tracy Morgan and Bruce Willis. How did I miss this? Everybody hates it except for me. I mean, that, that's a good cast and a great director, so. I, I thought it was hilarious, but that one movie with Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell came out around the same time, and I think it kind of fell on the thunder. Uh, what well, I don't remember what that one was called. I forgot what it was called, but I feel like it, it really fell the thunder of a, of a buddy cop movie. And 2021 Jump Street came out around that time, too. I think you're right. It was, it was kind of a weird period for a buddy cop resurgence. Um, and interestingly, something I, I read on IMDb was... Michael Nori was offered the part of Riggs in Lethal Weapon, but turned it down to take the hidden. Really? Yeah. But in all rights, was a, a great one of the best buddy cop movies ever. I think it might be my favorite, though Beverly Hills Cop might take that top slot. Oh, yeah. His favorite buddy cop film. Oh, yeah. Beverly Hills Cop is definitely, definitely one of my favorite buddy cop movies. Um, but Lethal Weapon is definitely no slouch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's up there. Um, so, uh, what did you think was... Did you think this film was unique? I thought it was unique the way it just started out. Because the way it starts out is, obviously, there's a car chase. It's like ultra-adrenaline action, which is fantastic. But you also don't know... I did not expect it to turn into, like, almost a sci-fi thriller. I, I thought this was, like, a cool, like, you know, like a cold war heist movie type deal. Almost a dry, like, a crazy action sequence. And there are great action sequences in this movie. There's a great action movie in the corner. But it takes a turn that just goes nuts in crazy different directions. Yeah, it really set the tone, I felt like, as a movie that just didn't give any fucks. Because you're completely correct. It feels like it's going to be this giant action adventure. And then it does have a lot of action sequences in it and car chases. But then in between those, there are lots of very slow, kind of awkward moments that are very dryly comedic. Yeah. But it was it was a, dy- a dynamic that just really worked for the film overall. Very much so. Like, I, like, I'm surprised this movie is more well known than it, than it is. It follows through with everything that we expect of it. The acting I think is very well performed, and there's even some cameos by some people that you may recognize. Yes, and uh, this was. Gabe's first time seeing the film, of course, but uh, I've seen it probably three or four times now. There's there's one sequence I always forget about where there's a young Danny Trejo in jail yeah. because Danny Trejo's like always in jail or about to go to jail in everything he's in. And, but even young Danny Trejo is still kind of old Danny Trejo, which yeah, was rather yeah. jarring. But you just hear his voice, and I we were sitting there, and I was just like, "Is that is that Danny Trejo?" And sure enough, about 30 seconds later, they, like, pan to his face behind bars. <laughs> Danny Trey has a very grizzled face, so he had at least had the appearance that he is at least 55 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's the Danny Trejo effect. Yeah. Um, neither Gabe nor I are suffering from that yet, but give, yeah. us, a, give us a couple months or years or something, and I'm sure we'll oh, have the Danny Trejo effect. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that you feel like this should have more of a following. So, one question I have, do you think this is a cult film? I feel like it is... It could become a cult film. Like, it could become one of those mutilators or something that 
it's more well known that people need to push this movie more. I feel like it's just a, a good old film at this point, but I feel like it should be getting the recognition that some of these older films that are getting these days. So if you haven't seen the hair, like I suggest it, I want to get it to a status where we're getting a shot called Blu-rays or, or Arrow or some of those companies. And because I, I want to know more about this movie, and I want to know about, more about the production of it. It's a movie I'll definitely watch again. If I can find it on DVD or something, that'd be great. It'd be awesome if they did a Blu-ray remaster. It has. It's been released a few times. There was even a special edition DVD. And supposedly in August of 2017, Warner Archive revealed that they were releasing a special edition of the film. But I'm not sure any details on that, if it was released or has yet to be released. Mm. Uh, but yeah, no, this is definitely one that I go back and revisit. I, I will, I'm going to go ahead and just say that it's a cult film. Because I, I do think it has a lot of the makings of one, and maybe this is just my hopeful thinking uh, or way of trying to turn it into a cult film. But it did; it had a sequel that came out in '93. But from what I hear, the sequel's pretty abysmal. I looked it up on Rotten Tomatoes; it has no critic score, and it has a 14% audience rating, uh, and it doesn't star. Either Michael Nori or Kyle MacLachlan in it. Really? Yeah. So I feel like it was just destined for failure. But uh, a couple things about The Hidden that I feel like do make it a cult film. Or, or maybe a budding cult film. But it, it did garner a lot of awards. And it was nominated for two Saturn Awards, even though it didn't win any. And... Uh, the David Lynch directed Twin Peaks, which you know I'm a big fan of, uh, starred Kyle MacLachlan as a very quirky FBI agent. So I feel like The Hidden is almost like a spiritual successor to that, uh, because the character of Lloyd Gallagher is this very offbeat FBI agent, and even the uh, the opening scene with uh, Chris Mulkey who stars as Jack, the guy who robs the bank and drives the car. So he was actually someone who was pretty prominent in Twin Peaks later on. So I just feel like it kind of like set that up. So I feel like it was inspired by a lot of classics, like like I mentioned earlier. And then it also, I feel like, went on to inspire a few things. The last two movies we watched had at least had one actor or actress that I think that was in Twin Peaks. Maybe it's a streak we should keep Maybe up. Maybe Slapshot is a streak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I feel like David Lynch when he was brainstorming. Like, you know, they win the championship, and then he rules the Twin Peaks after that. He uses his degree to become a, a, a police officer in Twin Peaks. So it's, it's very... He changed his name. He didn't want to be known for his acting career. You never know. It looks like the Celluloid Fiends podcast has just turned into the uh, Twin Peaks fan fiction podcast. Oh, yes, yes. Even though I have only seen two episodes of Twin Peaks. Oh, Gabe, that, that has to change. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the biggest Twin, like, twin Peaks guy. Like, like, I get why people like it. It's just really not for me. Like, I, I, like, no, actually, I, I haven't really given it like, too big a shot. I should probably like give it four or five episodes before I put on the towel on it, but I was I was I watched two episodes and I was like, eh, this is kind of not my thing. It, it's just gonna be like Stockholm Syndrome, where I'm just gonna bring it up every podcast until you finally decide to watch the series. Well, good thing I'm controlling the next podcast. <laughs> no oh, I'll, I'll shoehorn it in there somehow. Oh, don't worry. Yeah. yeah. I you're gonna shoehorn your Lord of Illusion. Well, I know. I think uh, I was going to do that, but you just did my job for me uh, by bringing up Lord of Illusions. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to keep talking about the hidden. 
the most wanted criminal in the universe. It's not human. Has come to Earth. Step out of the car slowly. Now, nothing can stop it. Except the cop. Who followed it here. Am I crazy? Or does this seem just a little bizarre? You think it's over now? The Hidden. You're wrong. Rated R. Now playing at a theater near you. Hey guys, we're back and we're talking about the 1987 sci-fi film The Hidden. So, uh, Gabe, you mentioned that you really enjoyed this one. Oh, I loved it. So, what did you love the most about it? I just loved the blind cop aspect of it. I love the fact that it took you through a loop. It gave you something that you didn't necessarily expect from the beginning. Which was kind of a John Carpenter sci fi film. With all the aliens and like the tooth or the gross alien that came out of the mouth. And like, it was a very, very cool movie that I liked it a lot. Yeah, the effects, you, uh, you have a really good point. They were kind of John Carpenter esque. This, it was practical effects. And the alien coming out of people and going into them was actually done with stop motion, which I thought was really neat. Uh, and one kind of uh, weird comparison that I would make is I felt like the hidden was a little bit like they live. Yeah, it kind of was. Except for it was a little less than a bad actor. <laughs> because the guy the military was just a regular cop. Well, they would have had Ron Roddy Piper just kicking ass and taking names. And, and he, chewing bubblegum. And chewing bubblegum. Well, he was all out of bubblegum. <laughs> because he was chewing it. Yeah, no, no. There was there was less badassery, but I mean, when you have Rowdy Roddy Piper, which is just such a fun name to say, uh, it, the level of badassery is pretty much untouchable. But I, I think it was just that they both had this weird pacing of these huge action sequences that are really memorable. Oh yeah, and then these very like slow moving quirky scenes in between. So what do you think inspired this movie, and what do you think was inspired by it? Like, Are there any films that come to mind? I think um, the upcoming generation of sci-fi writers would, could definitely be inspired by this movie. Maybe, the, um, maybe Terminator 2. Mm -hmm. like a lot of 90s stuff, like maybe Aliens, stuff like that. Just... You name it, you got it. Like this, this is pretty much sci-fi '90s by the book. It could be a very, very inspirational film if you're a young sci-fi writer or director. Yeah, uh, and and those are actually a couple of my favorites right there that you just named: uh, Terminator Two and, and Aliens. Uh, there's something about sequels that were made around that era. Uh, it, was, it was a good time for sequels to come out. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably, like, it's, it's very rare that you get a sequel that's as good as the original. Me, me and my now fiance always argue because he thinks that Men in Black 2 is better than Men in Black 1. And, oh. and yeah, that, that's like a big no no for, for me. No. And, and she, she constantly argues. About that with me. She also says that Rush Hour 2 is better than Rush Hour 1. And I don't agree with that either. And her response to, my, to me saying that is always, Gabe, have you seen Men in Black 2? Or have you seen Rush Hour 2, Gabe? And I'm like, yes, I have. They are both not as good as the original. She just keeps on arguing that point. But then again, she always argues that Halloween 4 is better than Halloween 3, hmm. and I think Halloween 3 is better than Halloween 4. Halloween 3 is... It, it, for me, it even rivals the first Halloween, and I love the first Halloween. 
But I do have a soft spot for Halloween 4 because that was like the film that got me into the Halloween There's franchise. There's nothing wrong with Halloween 4. There's absolutely nothing with Halloween 3, you know, with Halloween 2 and Halloween 4. But Halloween 3, like, I, like a lot of people don't see what Todd Carpenter was trying to do with Halloween 3. What he was trying to do is make it more like what J.J. Abrams is doing with the Cloverfield franchise. He's, instead of the one constant story, he's turning it, he was trying to turn it into separate Halloween stories, crazy things that would happen on Halloween, and people just did not get the vision. I got the vision, a lot of people did not, and it wasn't until maybe 10 years ago that people started getting Halloween for another shot. Yeah, it's really had a revisionist history, which I we've both been really excited to have witnessed. So, speaking of sequels, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but The Hidden did have a sequel. I neither of us have seen it, so we can't really talk about the sequel itself and what happens. But do you think this was a movie that needed a sequel? Not in particular. I feel like it pretty much was. A good standalone movie. But then again, a lot of people would say that Terminator didn't need a sequel. Alien didn't need a sequel. But they always surprise us with a sequel. And sequels can either make or break a franchise is what it comes down to. So the fact that there was a sequel is not surprising. It's the fact that the sequel flopped kind of let me know that when there wasn't a third one and it had to be bad condition. Right. Uh, I completely agree. It is a very standalone film. And one thing I, I do want to talk about is the ending. Because I thought the ending was totally the weakest part of the film. I still love the film. And it's one of my favorite sci-fi films of all time. Uh, and I really hope it features a revisionist history. Kind of like Halloween Theory. And people kind of go back and appreciate it for what it is. But... I feel like the end was the one part where it kind of lost that unique quality and kind of turned into just a more straightforward sci-fi film. And it even just completely went over the top with, like, the fucking flamethrower. Of course, like, when that, like, one of the detectives is walking through... Like the the department just casually carrying a flamethrower, like in the yeah. in, in like the middle of a film. So when that happens, I feel like it's a bit of a Chekhov's gun. You're like, okay, yeah, that that wasn't just casual. Like that was an intentional moment, and you're gonna see that flamethrower come back at the end. Right. And but it was, I think it was more than just that. It went over the top. It was that kind of trite plot of the uh, the the alien was taking control of people's bodies and was working its way up politicians like trying to be, become mayor and eventually trying to become the president right and i just feel like that's been done in a lot i think that was that was kind of like what uh, what damien was trying to do in like the omen franchise kind of work his way up the political ladder so i just i feel like that was a plot that had been done before uh, do do you have any thoughts on the ending? <laughs> I didn't really have anything wrong with the ending. It was pretty much um, how do I put this? It was very much a very very predictable ending. Like as soon as you find out this guy who was like a senator or a mayor was trying to become president, you like I I was like. It's trying to go after that guy. It's going to try to go after that guy, and that's the end of it. I knew it was going to happen, and I knew that as soon as the, you see the flamethrower, I'm like, oh, this is going to come into play somehow. Because it's, it's so 80s. It is so 80s. It's like, whenever they pan to something, you're like, look at this. And then you're like, that's going to come into play later. Yeah, it was it was pretty choreographed, and you're right. This the movie is very '80s, except one element that I really liked was I, I thought the soundtrack was was very well done. Oh, very well done, very very well done. I the soundtrack thoroughly. Uh, and and that's both in terms of there was an original score, but 
also just a lot of the music that plays throughout the film. Uh, and the, the original soundtrack was not some like super like pop synthy number, like Harold Waltemeyer. Uh, it was, it was actually like kind of full strings and it had some nuance to it. Yeah. The- It really got hit in the soundtrack <laughs> during those parts. But overall, even this is the original score was just fantastic. And one of, for me, one of the most fun uh, parts of this film watching all of the different hosts for the alien and kind of seeing how they changed and they were just very really uninhibited during that. Did you did you have a favorite host? I like Yeah, female stripper host was my favorite. One. She was my favorite as well, and, and I think that's, uh, I, I think that's in part because of how they hammed up a lot of her scenes. I think she also had the most time with the alien, but there's like one scene where these cops like stop her. And they see her get out of the car and they just start lowering their guns and they're like, oh, it's going to be one of those evenings. And then she just like pulls out this machine gun. <laughs> and also, I really liked that chase scene that they have with her in the in the mannequin factory. I think it was called like Neptunes. Yeah, that was fun. Um, my, definitely my second favorite host was he was the dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was that was a that was a pretty solid host. Oh yeah, uh, and I that was something I was actually really curious about uh, after the fact, and it didn't it wasn't really touched upon in the film, but I was curious what the difference in like a human host and an animal host would be. Right, and I was wondering if there even was a difference. Well, in my opinion. I- It was very non intimidating dog. So it's not like a pit bull or rat. It's like, oh, little. I think it was, what kind of dog? I don't know. It was. It's just a small dog. It's just very inconspicuous. Yeah, I don't remember the, the kind of dog it was, but it was, uh, like you said, very inconspicuous. And But it, even its behavior was more dog like. So I was wondering if. Uh, that was like a conscious decision on the part of this being to try to get to its next human host, or maybe it had more control over that host. Because with a lot of the other human hosts, it seemed to just be like having fun and it didn't seem to be working toward its goal until much later in the film. It seemed just kind of like stealing cars and and having chases. It just seems like breaking the law for the sake of breaking the it was just like, well, I'm going to go kill people and rob places and take anything I want and get money. But you don't realize till later on in the movie that there's a there's an end point to all this. There is, like, a plan. Like, you, you just think that, oh, man, this alien, it, like, I felt like almost like it was, like, a career, a career thing where it made them, like, it, it made <laughs> it, it, it Oh, crazy. Like, an inch, like, you'd, like, something from a different planet that escaped from a space prison. I felt like that. It was just... Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I hadn't thought about, you know, Critter's connection there, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it, I think it had escaped. Uh, because I think uh, Gallagher mentioned at some point that he caught up to this creature on like another planet, but I, I can't remember the exact uh, dialogue. Well, I know we've been chasing him for a long, long time, so it wasn't necessarily where it just escaped <coughs> from a space prison, but it may have been like a, a, some, something that had been going on for a long time, and he was doing bad things across the universe. And, and this was, of course, a little bit more competent than the critters. 
Oh, I love critics. Oh, um, no, I love them, but they were not the most competent. Uh, no, no. They were not. Criminal extraterrestrials. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to keep talking about The Hidden. I want to be president. What's in the bag? Security equipment. Open it up. Hey guys, welcome back. We're talking about the 1987 classic, The Hidden. So, Gabe, what are your some of your favorite 70s and 80s sci-fi films? Um, definitely The Thing. Classic. John Carpenter can't really go wrong with that. No. Um, Alien. <sighs> Love it. Um, who else? What do you think? Terminator. Definitely have to be on the top of that list. Star Wars? Yes. Like, I know that's not really a, a call movie, but it's one of my favorite sci fi franchises of all time. Easily. Yeah, definitely. How about you, Mo? So, uh, a couple of, of the ones you named def definitely would agree with those. The Hidden, I would actually throw on this list. It's. One of my favorite movies of any genre, but definitely one of my top favorite sci-fi films. I'd also throw out The Blob, and that was the 1988 remake. And I would throw out Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, that was definitely. one which I love. And the, the, the 50s version is good, but the 78 Invasion of the Body Snatchers is just magnificent. Oh, fantastic. I mean, everything from, like, the effects to kind of that 70s paranoia that it really embodied. And that like, that final scene, uh, I saw this not too long ago for the first time on a big screen. And it's just such a powerful final moment. Uh, so that was, that's definitely one. And, and I just feel like there's so many from, like, the 70s and 80s. Uh, I'm sure we're missing some. Especially if you start getting into like sequels, like oh, if we throw out like Aliens. That was the eighties. I think it was like eighty six, because I think the first one in the nineties was, I want to say like Alien Three. But um, Aliens and Alien, I both love. 
I think I like Alien better though. Alien definitely was the best Alien, <clears throat> even though Alien was like very, very exciting and great. I feel the claustrophobia and the fear of space and Alien way more, especially since you are alone. You are in a ship with an alien, and you have nowhere else to go. Very scary. Absolutely. Because it's basically like a slasher film in space. And I think the original concept, it was like pitched as something like Jaws in space, Mm -hmm. which it very much feels like, but Jaws, to me, doesn't feel that scary. It's more like a drama that happens to have some elements in it. Right. uh, Some horror elements in it. Whereas Alien is just completely brutal. And like the effects, I think even, are a lot better than the CG that I see in films these days. Oh, yeah. Uh, but Aliens was... That one was just more like a hellacious journey. And that was much more on the action side. Yeah, well, you have... I think Cameron coming in for Aliens. And we all know his... His MO at the time was... Things like Terminator and stuff like that. And we went to go on Terminator 2, Titanic, Avatar. Several things that it keeps on raising the bar in the South Park. James Cameron always raises the bar. And that's why I think, kind of since Aliens, people have kind of not appreciated the Alien franchise as much as they should. Especially Prometheus. Prometheus, I love that film. I think it's very misunderstood. And actually, like right beside us, <laughs> recording right now, I have like a giant picture of uh, a giant poster from Prometheus hanging up uh, in, in in my room here. Uh, but I, I just loved the way it felt like the original Alien, where in Alien, it's like the ship and the crew and the planet. It's all very vague. And in Prometheus, it was the exact same way. But I think people went into that expecting... A, they expected a xenomorph. And there was kind of something similar at the end, but not really what they were expecting. And then the other side of that was... I think people thought this would answer a lot of questions about the xenomorph. And it it really wasn't to do that. It was more of an answer to the space jockey that was originally an alien. Um, It kind of questioned where man came from. I know I'm I'm getting off topic here, but I'm going to think. I'm going to talk about a theory here. And people, that whole movie was like, why were space jockeys going to come over? Basically, kill the humans. Like they find out what, what they were shipping, and that they were going to Earth to kill the humans, basically. And I have a, uh, a philosophy because at the beginning of the movie, you see like a uh, uh, engineer, space jockey. Um, you see him kind of sacrifice himself into the waters of Earth. And what I think that was was the chain reaction of him creating life on this planet. Now. When you get back to see, there's a scene in the movie where they carbon date the engineer's head. They carbon date it and they say it's over 2,000 years old. They say it's over 2,000 years old. And you really got to think about it. And you got to think about why they were trying to kill the human race. And then you really think about what happened over 2,000 years ago, Mo. People started believing in Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. I I see where you're going with this. So I think they were upset that they were starting to worship other other gods other than themselves. So they they decided to eliminate the human race. Okay. As punishment. I you know I kind of I kind of like that theory. That's this is the first time I've heard that. So. Apparently, the Celluloid Fiends podcast is now going to be not only the Twin Peaks uh, fan fiction podcast, but also the Alien fan fiction podcast from now on. <laughs> but it's a theory. I had 
since the movie first came out, people think I'm crazy. But if you really look at it, it's 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 a viable theory if you really think about it. Absolutely, I don't know that it was necess- I don't think that was an intentional part of Prometheus. But I, I like your theory, and I think you could totally support that with what happens in the franchise and what happens in the film. Right, exactly. So did, did you end up seeing Alien Covenant? I did. What were your thoughts on that? Surprisingly, I did not enjoy it as much as I enjoyed Prometheus. Still a very good film, but not... I didn't like it as much as I liked Prometheus. I have the same reaction. I mean, I love the heck out of it just because... I, I'll watch anything in the Alien universe for the most part, except like I even enjoyed the first Alien vs. Predator movie. Alien vs. Predator Requiem is one of the worst films that I have ever seen, and I think it's the only film that I've ever given one star out of five. And that was only because my rating system wouldn't let me go below that. I just thought it was awful. There was no character development. It was really dark, on two levels. One, it was really difficult to see. I had to like crank up the brightness oh, on my yeah, TV that, and I, I still I couldn't see anything. Like, <laughs> what's going on? I, I, like, what's going on? Yeah, and I think even more than just getting back to the Xenomorph, I think Covenant felt like it had to provide a lot more answers, because it did really seem to just provide a lot of answers and give a lot of backstory. Still, I enjoyed the film, but not nearly as much as Prometheus, which is weird, because uh, you, you had the same thoughts that I did, but most people that I've talked to who saw both Prometheus and Covenant enjoyed Covenant a lot more. And I think it's just for those reasons, like you want to have answers. It's like human nature, but I actually preferred Prometheus for everything that was vague in it. I love movies that make you feel like you have questions. I love questions. People, people just apply <coughs> them sometimes these days. Like people always walk into a movie thinking everything's going to be answered. But I always love the movies that make you think, make you come up with theories that I just came up with about Prometheus. I always enjoy a movie that gives you questions instead of answers. And with the instant gratification of today, it's hard to make a movie like that. And especially a big budget movie like Prometheus. And that's why I love Prometheus. Because not a lot of movies get made like that these days. But Ridley Scott, he was like, I'm returning to my science fiction roots, and they gave him the money to make Prometheus. And people were disappointed because, oh, he did, there's no aliens. There's no Xenomorphs. <laughs> they were so sad that it wasn't aliens, it wasn't Xenomorphs. And, and I feel like he, Alien Covenant was kind of him like, all right, guys, I get it. You have your Xenomorphs, whatever. And here it was kind of a sequel to Prometheus, but I feel like he wanted to justice. Agreed. So, uh, getting back to the hidden, uh, let's rate this member, dude. All right, all right. Go ahead, no. You want me to go first? Yeah, uh, I'll let you go first. This movie a four out of five. Okay, and why a four out of five? A four out of five because I feel like if the ending wasn't so by the book, it could have possibly gotten a five star. 
but it feels the same way. It's kind of the easy way out that I'd not be proud of style, but everything else was fantastic at this point. And I couldn't, I couldn't put it anything below four stars. Uh, I'm gonna give it a four point five out of five, and the that half a star is for pretty much the same reason that you mentioned. I, I felt like the ending could have been a lot stronger, but I still feel like it's a very effective film and it has a lot of different qualities to it uh, from kind of that buddy cop vibe to sci-fi. And I feel like there are even kind of a few like horror tinges in there, probably just because uh, the director dabbled in so many uh, horror films like Nightmare Part 2, which is actually my favorite of the Nightmare films. Uh, but aside from the ending, I, I feel like it's hard to really criticize any part of this film. The acting's great. It has a, it has a wonderful score. Uh, and it's, it's a film that I really hope kind of catches on and becomes more popular and gets the recognition that we both feel it deserves. I want to see a monopoly. That's, that, that's what I'll be happy with this movie. I want, I want this movie to get to a point where people are starting to look at this movie like they look at, look at Return of the Living Dead and Popcorn. I definitely want a Blu-ray re-release of this, maybe in a 4K. Like, I think that this movie is... It's, it's a shame that not a lot of people have seen this movie. It has great reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. And uh, Roger Ebert gave it, I believe, three out of four. So it was recognized by critics at the time. Uh, it just didn't perform too well at the box office. I couldn't figure out the budget. I couldn't find that information anywhere. And the nine million seemed respectable, but I feel like that didn't perform as well as expected. And I think it was only until later on, on its home video release, that it kind of gained a little bit more popularity. Oh, of course. Yeah. If, if there's ever a Mondo poster release, uh, like, I will totally get that. I will sell out the that poster. Or any kind of Gary Cohen poster or any kind of special print. Because this movie was amazing. I will pay money for the Blu-ray. It was streaming and everything these days. I have kind of strayed away from buying buying hard copies of things because everything's going digital now. But there are movies that I do like having hard copies of, and this is definitely a movie I'll buy a DVD or a DVD Blu-ray group pack with because this movie is just fantastic and I want to show my friends. Yeah, no, this is this is worthy of inclusion in any DVD or Blu-ray collection. So uh, that's our that's our show for tonight. All right. Thanks for listening. Uh, don't forget head over to the iTunes Store, the Google Play Store, or your favorite podcast app, and subscribe. Give us a like on Facebook, and you know what? If you have any suggestions of what you want us to review, hit us up. All right. We will be back with some more podcasts. There's a very special in my heart. We are going to be talking about horror, horror which is the combination of horror movies and rap, which is something that I've been looking to for the last 20 years. And we look really forward, I look, I'm really looking forward to this next one. So, but I'm Gabriel Orto. And I'm Mo Long. And this has been the Cellular Dream Spike Podcast. I no, no, I can't prove it. You've got to believe me. Believe me. Take it off the air now, please. You've got to at least Please excuse the interruption. We're having technical problems. Please stand by. It's time. It's time. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by.
dark masks. Gather round your TV set, put on your masks, and watch. All witches, all skeletons, all jack o -lanterns. The third Gather commercial, round, it's still on, please. Watch Take off the third channel, the third channel, it's still running. Stop it, please, for God's sake, please stop it. There's no more time. You've got to, please, stop it, stop it now, turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 Stop it.